Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Mike Blazenden. I'm currently a postdoc at the University of British Columbia, but today I'm going to be talking about a bunch of work that I did as a grad student and a postdoc um, at Yale University. So hopefully I don't have to convince uh, any of you or many of you that we live in a microbial world, right? Every ecosystem on this planet has microbes, and in many cases they are the most numerous or the most dominant form of life on our planet. And for many of these microbes, their home is something like us, right? So this is a pair of lungs. I want you to imagine this is maybe a patient who's immunocompromised, and their lungs are constantly bringing in and out air from the environment. And so if an opportunistic pathogen is floating on that air and finds its way into these lungs, it will very quickly start to replicate and create a kind of virulent infection in, um, in the person. Of course, the title of this session is co-infection, and microbes are rarely found in isolation in nature. So more likely, there's a whole kind of milieu of different bacterial species or microbes in those lungs that we might want to remove in order to improve the patient's outcomes. And in the past, we might have treated this sort of infection with something like chemical antibiotics. But as I'm sure you're probably aware, chemical antibiotics are increasingly failing because these bacteria have been exposed so many times, and so they're evolving resistance to these, these chemical antibiotics. So some of my work has been motivated by kind of emerging alternate or complementary ways to treat these sorts of infections, and in particular, bacteriophages. So this is a bacteriophage. Um, it's a virus that specifically infects bacteria. And many phages, when they infect their bacterial host, will end up killing the bacterial host. And so there's kind of ongoing work to see whether we could take a phage that targets a pathogen that maybe a patient is infected with, put it into their lungs, and as it replicates, it will start wiping out that bacterial infection, right? But we already just said that there's never really just one bacterial pathogen, right? And the problem or maybe limitation of phages is that they're often very, very specific to the bacterial species that they will kill, right? In the real world, there's all these pathogens co-infecting the lung and our phage is only really going to knock down one of them. Moreover, in the lab, a lot of our understanding of how phages and bacteria interact and their kind of evolutionary dynamics is built on these really simple experiments where we're just doing it in isolation, right? We're removing the complexity of the natural world in order to try and better understand. But in that, we kind of create a gap between what's happening out there and what's happening in our experiments. And so how can we bridge that gap, right? That gap of kind of the level of diversity in the community. So one idea that, that me and my advisor kind of hit on was what if you just ran experiments where you manipulated that diversity yourself to see what you might be missing by kind of leaving out this, these co-infecting bacterial pathogens, right? So you could do your classic experiment with one phage and one bacteria, look at their ecology, look at their evolution in the lab, and then you could use the exact same strains, but you add in more diversity. You create a kind of in vitro co-infection, and you see, okay, what changed, right? Right? What might we be missing when we look at these really simple reductionist experiments? So that's what we set out to do. Um, we set up four different treatments that kind of varied whether you had the phage or that kind of co-infection context, that diversity. Right, so we have a real simple community. This is like our negative control. It's just bacteria growing alone. Then we add in the phage. So these two are our kind of traditional bacteriophage experiments. And then we do that sort of co-infection community, that diverse community context, right? So one without phage and one with phage. And we take these communities that we've built and we use experimental evolution, right? So we'll put them all into a flask, we'll grow them for 24 hours, and then after 24 hours, we'll take a little sample, we'll put it in fresh media. And we keep doing this day after day, and over time, the, the bacteria, the microbes, they replicate many times, right? And so over the course of our nine-day experiment, they get about 65 generations of evolutionary time in, right? And so from this, we can study how those evolutionary dynamics differ depending on this co-infection context. 
So for those who are particularly microbially minded, uh, here are the microbes that we're actually using. So Pseudomonas ruginosa is an opportunistic pathogen. It frequently infects cystic fibrosis patients who have um, compromised immune systems in their lungs. Staph aureus, Enterococcus faecalis, and Acromobacter xylus oxidans are also common um, cystic fibrosis lung infection um, pathogens. And then this phage that we're using is specifically targeting the Pseudomonas ruginosa. Okay, so how does this co-infection context, how does it shape the population dynamics? Well, I'll give you a little spoiler for the bacterial side. We see coexistence of all of the pathogens under basically all of the conditions. So I'm going to skip that in the interest of time and look just at the phage population dynamics. So here what I've plotted on the y-axis is the phage population density in each of our eight completely independent replicate populations. And uh, in just that top right box right now, that's just the pseudomonas and the phage growing together, right? And what we see is that there's a lot of variation between otherwise independent experimental replicates, right? Some phage populations are crashing, they're doing very poorly, the phage maybe goes extinct. In other populations, the phages are persisting quite well. By contrast, when you're in that co-infection, the phages do much better on average. Very few of the phage populations uh, get anywhere near extinction, and many of them are sitting at quite high densities throughout the entire time series. So we next kind of wanted to understand, okay, what's driving these differences, right? What, how is this kind of community diversity, this co-infection, uh, changing, changing phage persistence? So we went back to our time series. As you might expect, one of the main traits that might be driving this is the evolution of resistance and infectivity. So we went back to our time series and we went in our freezer, we pulled out isolates of phages and bacteria from different days of the experiment. And then we just simply measured how well is the phage infecting those bacteria, right? Did the bacteria evolve resistance? Did the phage lose infectivity? What's, what's going on? And what we see is that really rapidly the bacteria evolve resistance. So plotted here is just the frequency of phage resistance um, on each of those days from our experiment, one, two, four, and eight. And within 24 hours, like 95% of the bacteria that we can pull out are resistant to phage infection. But that 5% doesn't go anywhere. It just hangs on. Throughout the entire experiment, we continue to see uh, very rare bacterial isolates that we pull out that are phage susceptible, even though they've been evolving, maybe co-evolving with phages for eight, nine days at the time. So why, why is that? Why are there kind of susceptibles? Well, I think it has a lot to do with the mechanism that these bacteria are evolving resistance. So allow me a, a brief interlude towards molecular biology. So this is you know, our hypothetical pseudomonas cell. It has a structure called the type 4 pilus, and it uses the type 4 pilus for all sorts of virulence and pathogenicity things. For our purposes, the type 4 pilus is also the structure that the phage kind of hijacks and takes advantage of. So when the phage is floating around, if it comes in contact with that pilus, it will attach its tail fibers to it and use that to inject its genome inside of the cell. So if the bacteria evolve a mutation where they lose that pilus or they break that pilus, now the phage doesn't have the capacity to attach to the cell, it can't infect. Right? And you get an unhappy phage and a very happy bacteria. Fortunately for us, it's really actually easy to measure the pilus because the bacteria use it to move around. So these are some pseudomonas cells, I believe, but definitely bacteria cells using a pilus to twitch on a surface, right? And so you can just measure, are they moving or are they not? And if they're not moving, they probably broke their pili. So that's what we did with the help of a great undergrad, Abe, in the lab. Um, we measured the twitching motility of these bacteria on the y-axis. And here I'm just plotting it based on whether the bacteria was susceptible, partially susceptible, or resistant in those earlier assays where we measured phage susceptibility. Now, you might expect that there's sort of a declining pattern, that as you are more resistant to phage infection, that probably means you broke your pilus more or you removed your pilus more. In fact, what we see is that almost all of the bacteria have changed their pilus in some way, right? Nearly all of those orange points, so all the bacteria kind of evolving in that phage-added population, have mutations that have altered their pilus's function for moving across surfaces. Now, we don't know whether the pilus structure is still there or not, but as a kind of functional macromolecule, most or nearly all of them have modified it, right? And 
we then sequenced these populations to see whether we see that in the genome, and in fact we do. Right? So here what I'm going to plot is all of the unique mutations we found in any of our populations. And for each mutation, I'm just plotting it based on the maximum frequency we find it in any of the nophage populations and the maximum frequency in any of the phage populations. So we end up with a scatter plot. Along the kind of bottom right are those mutations that we only see when there's no phage around. The diagonal are these mutations that are probably beneficial or, or evolving in both treatments. Um, but the really interesting thing is on the left-hand side, those are mutations that are only showing up in the treatments where we added phage, right? And if you notice the orange points, which are those that are related to this pillar structure, they're highly overrepresented in that kind of column of data points, right? So we pull that column out and look for whether those data points that are kind of only mutations in the phage added treatment, whether they differ depending on this co-infection context, depending on the presence of these other bacteria, we do see that there are a, a, a wide variety of these sort of pillus resistance mutations. So some are sitting on the kind of x-axis down at the bottom. Those are showing up only in that kind of no co-infection treatment. Some are sitting on the left. Those are showing up only in the co-infection condition. And some are sitting kind of in the middle in the top right. Those are maybe beneficial in both. And so this sort of suggests that the, the Pseudomonas bacteria, they're taking different routes of resistance evolution depending on the presence of these other bacteria around. And finally, we wanted to understand whether these different routes might be related to fitness in some way. So what we did is we took those bacterial isolates and we measured how dense do they grow essentially in isolation, right? There's no phages around, no competitors, no anything. Are they just growing worse? Um, and we used a, a proxy, which is just the maximum density over 24 hours of growth. So here we see kind of our ancestors, they grow to some level, and uh, bacteria that have evolved for just one day, if they've evolved in the presence of phage, maybe they have slightly reduced density. Certainly the, the no phage are the same. But on day two, there becomes a really pronounced difference, right? These bacteria are growing quite poorly even though they're just growing in the exact same medium, right? And this kind of suggests that there are some costs to evolving this resistance. And as we continue on the time series, what we see is that that cost largely gets ameliorated. Probably there are compensatory mutations arising that allow the bacteria to kind of catch up with, um, with their compatriots who didn't have to experience the kind of phage pressure. So, the kind of major takeaways from this project and, and what we've seen so far is that this, this context of co-infection, this diversity, really seemed to favor the coexistence of bacteria and their phages. And this coexistence is mediated by persistence of this kind of subpopulation of more susceptible host bacteria, which might be driven by the costs of having this resistance. So I want to make sure I thank my co-authors, Paul, my advisor, William and Abe, um, both wonderful undergrads who worked with me, my funding sources, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, so we looked for cyclical dynamics or kind of negative frequency dependence. We couldn't find it, and I think the issue is because it's such a small subpopulation that is actually susceptible or partially susceptible, it's really hard to isolate them. Like, it takes a lot of labor just to, just to find one, basically, in a, in a population, right? We pulled, oh, I forget how many bacteria, 500, 600 isolates, right? And we found, like, 15 or 20 that are susceptible at, from day one on. So it, it was really hard to look for those sorts of dynamics. We're doing some ongoing sequencing work, and the hope is that maybe from some of that sequencing, we might be able to get a little bit more at the kind of evolutionary dynamics. Yeah. Yeah, so 
often when we're, at least in our lab, um, when we're using phages, we're choosing phages where the evolution of resistance comes with some other benefit. So even if the bacteria evolve resistance, like in this case, they lose other things. They lose the ability to move around their environment. They lose virulence. They lose pathogenicity. And so the hope is that, okay, even if they evolve resistance, uh, well, now they're screwed because now they can't be as virulent or as pathogenic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Vanna. I am from ESAM, University of Montpellier. So today I'll be presenting you an experiment from my PhD, which is about facilitation between tetranical species and a plant virus, tomato spotted wilt virus during co-infections. So starting, everyone has said this in this uh, thing that the parasites, they are omnipresent and they, they are present in all kinds of kingdoms, but what parasites don't do is exist alone. So hosts are always infected by multiple parasites at the same time, which are called co-infections. And during co-infections, parasites can interact with each other, positively, negatively, or they might not interact with each other at all. So in this diagram, you see, so out of all the interactions which can take place between two species, the interactions which lead to one party, at least one of the parties getting benefited, they come under the umbrella term facilitation, which I'm really interested in. So for my system, I'm studying co-infections in my host, which is a tomato plant, Solanum lycopersicum. One of my parasite is spider mites. So these ones, the red ones are Tetranicus evansi, and here in the photo you can see why they are called spider mites, because these mites weave very strong webs onto their plant host. My second parasite is a plant virus, tomato spotted wilt virus. So this virus in nature is transmitted exclusively by thrips which uh, take it from a plant and then inoculate on, it onto the, another plant. But in my lab, in our system, we do a mechanical inoculation. So we are not using any thrips here. We just have spider mites and viruses which are mechanically inoculated. A bit more about the parasites I'm using. So the spider mites, Tetranicus evansi, it is a specialist herbivore on Solanaceae family and beans also. The spider mites, they are haplodiploid, so only fertilized eggs become females. So these mites have a life cycle of around 14 days in the lab, starting from egg, larva, to new stages, and adults. So the plant virus, tomato spotted wilt virus, it belongs to the genus Tospovirus and has three negative RNA segments. As I said, it's transmitted exclusively by some species of thrips in nature. So the tomato spotted wilt virus and also spider mites, they lead to huge economic losses for the crops. So they lead to like losses of billions for the agriculture and they are a major pest in the nature. So the symptoms of this virus, tomato spotted wilt virus, are stunted growth of plant. There are necrotic lesions, there are bronzing of leaves and the fruits are totally destroyed by this virus. Now, as I said, we mechanically inoculate the virus onto our plant. So how do we do it? It's, it's pretty easy. So firstly, we take a plant which has been already infected by this virus by any means and we take the plants from an uh, infected plant and we mix it with some buffer and charcoal. And in this paste, we add carborundum, which is a surface abra abrasive so that the plants can absorb the mixture. And then this mixture is applied manually to the leaves with your hand. So then the plants get infected, it's pretty easy. Now, so for my main, main experiment today, I am going to show you my previous results, which, I, which we did last year. So this, this graph is from the experiment where we wanted to test how tomato spotted wilt virus uh, increases the reproductive performance of the spider mites. So does this facilitate the spider mites or not? So in this experiment, we saw that on the x-axis, there are two spider mite species, Tetranicus evansi and Urticae, and on the y-axis is the total number of adults. So in this experiment, we found that the plants which were infected by, already infected by tomato spotted wilt virus in black, on those plants, spider mites gave rise to more adults, so there are more babies on those plants than the clean plants. And in this experiment, the main thing to notice here is the prior infection. So the plants were infected with viruses first. So we infected the plants with viruses, and after 14 days, we introduced the mites onto the plants. So on those plants, viruses facilitated the spider mites. Now, in another set of experiments, in these experiments, we tested if the facilitation is reciprocal. So how does spider mites affect the viruses in return? So in this experiment, we measured the viral load into the plants. And here you see 
So there are two strains of the same virus here, strain France 81 and strain Li1137. On the, on the x-axis, it's days after infection. So we had two points of testing here, day 21 after virus infection and 28. And on the y-axis, it's the viral load. So here we found that the plants, which were co-infected, first with the viruses and then with spider mites in the red, those plants, in those plants, the viral load was similar as to the plants which were only infected with virus. So we didn't see any effect of spider mites onto the viral load of the plants which were co-infected. Co so up to this point, uh, till last year, we established that when we infect our plants, first with tomato spotted wilt virus, the virus facilitates spider mites, but it's not reciprocal. The virus doesn't get any benefit in return. Okay, now, so how these parasites interact with each other, as Anne hinted in her uh, presentation that there could be either the host immune response or resources. So these are the mechanisms by which parasites interact with each other. So one of the proposed mechanism of the interaction of these two parasites are the antagonistic plant defenses. So the spider mites, they mainly activate the jasmonic acid pathway of the plant immune system. While the viruses, they activate the salicylic acid pathway of the immune system. So both these parasites are activating different pathways of, Im of immune system. And when both of the immune systems are activated at the same time, due to the presence of different sets of pathogens, they are, uh, they are in cross talk. So they are antagonistic to each other. The plant is not able to mount both of the immune uh, defenses at the same time. So what we propose is that when we are infecting our plants with viruses first, uh, I don't think you can see the cursor. It's okay. So when the plant is infected with the viruses first, it leads to the down regulation of jasmonic acid, which was giving spider mites an extra edge, an extra benefit for them to make more babies and be more uh, successful onto the host. And the second pathway could be the resource mediated, obviously. So we know from a lot of studies that the plant viruses and also tomato spotted wilt virus, so when they infect the plant, it leads to the, an abundance of free amino acids available in the host. So any kind of vector, non-vector, any kind of parasites, due to the presence of virus, they can have more free amino acid in the host to take and perform better. So these were two of the hypotheses. So what we thought that if, so, that does, so we know that the spider mites were getting facilitated when the viruses were infecting first. So what, what we wanted to see, will, the, will this interaction between these two parasites will change if we change the order of the infection? Okay, so to answer this question, I, so we had this experiment which, we, where we just changed the order of infection which parasite infects the host first. So obviously I have first, first where we, T even Z is my first parasite. So in the first treatment we have T even Z first infecting the host. I have simultaneous infections where we put both the parasite at the same time. I have only viruses first in the third treatment. And the fourth one is the control one where I only infect them with viruses, it's a single infection. So on day, so I'm infecting all the plants with viruses on day fourth, and I'm only changing the sequence of the infection of mites. So the results are the, on the base of when I'm putting spider mites onto the plants. So in the first treatment, I'm putting spider mites first, and in the third, spider mites go after the virus. And on day 14th, 10 days after putting, uh, after infecting the plants with viruses, we measured uh, tomato spotted wilt virus viral load using quantitative ELISA in all the plants. Also, also to tell you that in all the first three treatments, I have sham infected plants in all the treatments to compare, to compare the reproductive performance of spider mites in all the three respective treatments. So what are sham infected plants here? In these plants, we infect the plants with the buffer solution. So the solution doesn't have any viral particles in it. So we wound the leaves, but doesn't, uh, so it's not infected, it's just wounded plants for the sham infected plants. So what were, what were our predictions based on this infection? What, what do we wanted to see? What did we hope? So if the uh, interactions were mediated via negative immune crosstalk, so we thought that the facilitation should be strongest when the viruses were infecting the plant first. As I said, because the, when we put the viruses first, it leads to the down regulation of the defenses against spider mites, which leads them, which gives them an extra benefit. So we expected that the facilitation would be strongest when the viruses go first. We expected no or less facilitation when the mites infection go first. And, uh, and of course, if the interaction between plant defenses were reciprocal, they were antagonistic in equal amount, then the viruses should have an extra edge when the mites are going first. 
And if the facilitation were via resources, we expected that the facilitation should be strongest when the viruses go first. Of course, it's easier to have extra nutrition from a plant, which is already have extra free amino acids. So that's what we expected. And what did we find was facilitation of the mites. It actually did depend on the order of infection. So it was maximum when the viruses infected the plant first. So on the x-axis, it is the based on the arrival of spider mites. So if the mites, if we put the spider mites before, simultaneously, or after the viruses. So here we see that in the first one before, when the mites infect the plant first, we see facilitation. Not a lot, but we indeed we see facilitation. In the simultaneous treatment, we didn't see any facilitation. There were equal number of uh, daughters produced in mock and virus treatments. In the third one, where spider mites go after the viruses, we see a huge amount of facilitation, which we expected and we did see. So the red one, the top one are uh, virus infected and the, this is control plant. So based on our predictions, we see that the, when the viruses go first, we indeed see a huge amount of facilitation, which could be via one, one way, via immune cross-stroke, via uh, free amino acids, or maybe both. We see some facilitation when the mites go first. So as I said, the, in this treatment, when mites go first, we infect the plants with viruses four days after. So viruses cannot actually affect the number of babies produced, but what, what it can do is it can uh, better the juvenile survival on those plants because of free amino acids or the negative immune crosstalk. We didn't see any facilitation when the infections were simultaneous. So in this, in this uh, graph, you'll see that the, there were most number of mites onto the simultaneous treatment. So the plants was actually affected the most when both of the parasites affect, uh, infected the plant at the same, same time. So what do we think is, even due to wounding or due to virus, the mites are getting an extra edge uh, onto the simultaneous treatment. But we didn't see any facilitation here, which we expected to see. So we actually don't know why we don't see any facilitation here. Maybe we need to do another block to Make sure the, the data is, what does the data say? Okay, and now about the, so I, as I told you, we also measured the viral load in these plants in all the treatments, but we didn't see any difference in the viral load in the control before, simultaneous in the after treatments. So we think that the, it, so one reason could be the, that the, our spider mites are not suppressing the, suppressing the salicylic acid pathway enough to see any difference. But even major point could be that the effects could be different if, we're, if we were actually using the thrips. So now we are using known vectors and viruses in an isolated system, which is not measuring any actual transmission. But if there were vectors involved, there would be vector and known vector uh, interaction, which would, uh, which would make us actually see the effect of known vectors on the viruses. So I'm saying known vectors because spider mites are not a vector for uh, viruses. So known vectors could be benefiting from viruses, but they have to balance other interactions. So from these, in, from these experiments, we do know that the known vectors are getting benefited from the viruses for free because they, do, they are not affecting viruses in, in any way. But they have to do balance competition with vectors in nature. And what these experiments show that, that, that this, could actually, this could actually make known vectors manipulate their horse choice. So known vectors could be actually selecting the plants which are uh, infected by tomato spotted wilt virus already, then going to the plants which are not infected by tomato spotted wilt virus. And this could lead to the prevalence of multiple infections even in other systems. Okay, I'm on 13 minutes. And the facilitation in, in return can affect parasite life history and virulence evolution even of the viruses. So I would like to thank my supervisor and our lab members and our EEC team, our uh, collaborators at Indra Ivinyo, Yanis Mikalakis, and our uh, funding agencies. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's 14th minute, I see. Uh, okay, we can talk later if anyone has discussions or suggestions or more experiments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.